Welcome, I am Emir, and let's look back in hindsight. Today, we take a deep dive into the only Lime Street episode currently available online. If you haven't seen my introductory video on the show, you may watch it by clicking the links here. Warning, there will be spoilers. The episode begins with the pilots and the cabin crew of a plane who pretend that the plane had been hijacked by a man who demanded ransom money. There is no hijacker. And the whole thing was set up for these guys to make a quick buck. None of them are members of the main cast. They only appear in this episode and nowhere else. So why should we care about them? Simple. They're the culprits of the mystery of the week. Wait, wait, wait. Did the intro just give away the end game? Okay, we know who done it. Now let's flip over and see what the four old ladies in Miami are up to. I hope you see the problem here. The opening credits then play for a whopping 1 minute and 15 seconds, showing a main cast of 8 with only 4 having a major part in this episode and 2 cameoing. This theme song is lovely. I feel that it captures both the action adventure and the family aspects of the show. More credits then play before Wingate appears, talking through the phone to his boss in London. I've seen him before, but with white hair. I wonder where. Wingate assures his boss that their insurance firm won't have to pay the airline the quote-unquote ransom that it paid. This hijacking will not be a repeat of the D.B. Cooper fiasco, which brings us to another history lesson. Damn! I thought I'd exhausted all the history lessons in the last video. Okay, no matter. D.B. Cooper is the name given by the media to an unknown person who used the alias Dan Cooper. He hijacked a Northwest Orient Airlines flight in 1971, demanded a ransom of $200,000, got the money, jumped from the plane, never to be seen again. No one knows who he was or what happened to him. But some of the money was recovered by an 8-year-old boy in 1980. The show tries to mislead those watching that D.B. Cooper is responsible for this episode's caper. It's frustrating to see Wingate try to find out if D.B. Cooper was involved. However, we are not fooled because we know the truth. So, why are we still watching anyway? Because the episode does not care to keep the mystery, well, a mystery. I can confidently say that this plot is not even the A plot. It's the B plot. The A plot is the family story, which is fine. But keep the audience interested in both. If I'm not curious to see the mystery part unfold, why would I continue watching? Do I really want to see a 13-year-old prepare for her first date? How does this storyline start anyway? Culver and his two daughters have breakfast at a diner. They talk about Margaret Ann's classmate who likes big breasts. This conversation goes nowhere, does not contribute to the plot, and is never mentioned again. Elizabeth then tells her dad that she wants to look grown up. Just because it's my first dance doesn't mean I have to look like it. Culver is understandably worried. Elizabeth's date is two years older than her and just broke up with his girlfriend. Maybe Elizabeth is just the rebound girl. Elizabeth's Damn, Elizabeth is too long. Didn't the writers, or anyone, give her a nickname? Back to the B-plot. Wingate is already at the airport, where the hijacked plane landed. He's trying to impress this FBI official with a computer printout from the airline company. There's this sub-subplot of Wingate trying to suck up to the FBI but failing miserably. It's hard to watch without squirming. Elizabeth drives her family back to their farm. She complains, I'm never gonna be a good driver. Culver assures her, Well, you have plenty of time to practice. He 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 he. Culver then reminds her daughter that she's not allowed to car date. And Margaret Ann tells her sister, And you're not allowed to be acting sexy either, right dad? The B-plot finally gets hold of Culver, and he flies off to meet Wingate. The duo get a tip that the pilot and the co-pilot own a business at the airport, 
called the take off what kind of business is that a strip club without any stripping Okay, this episode has a tone problem. At one scene, Culver is a family man, a father to his two children. And the next scene, he's in a strip club. This is unnerving. I think Lime Street was not supposed to be for the entire family. Heart to heart wasn't. Or maybe Lime Street was supposed to be family friendly. After all, the show aired on Saturday nights. This specific episode aired at 9 p.m. on September 28, 1985. A Saturday. Can anyone enlighten me? Is the Saturday night time slot supposed to be family friendly or not? Culver uses Elizabeth's Girl Scout troop to look for the duffel bag containing the money. They instead find an unopened parachute hanging from a tree. This discovery ends up, one, pissing off the FBI, and two, in the papers. I just love how that headline is written, focusing on who discovered the unopened parachute, instead of, you know, the fact that it was found. It's like those headlines from Back to the Future Part 2. Finally, after 20 minutes of the uninteresting B-plot, we get to see the main plot again. Elizabeth tries out a black dress that everyone likes. Well, except for the dad. Culver notices that his elder daughter has been shaving her legs. He's understandably upset and having daddy issues problems. He tells Elizabeth, You're growing up entirely too fast and I want you to knock it off. Someone's in a rush to go through puberty. <sighs> Finally, Margaret Ann calls Elizabeth out. You know what? Toot it. I'm calling Elizabeth Samantha or Sam for the rest of this review. Three reasons. One, Elizabeth is just one syllable too many. Samantha. Elizabeth. Two, the name Elizabeth reminds me of an old lady. And three, Sam in this episode is not really playing a role. Here, she's no child diplomat, youth ambassador, or a journalist. Here, she's playing a 13-year-old girl. In short, she's playing herself. And it's not too hard to play yourself on TV. Or is it? Anyway, Margaret Ann, damn that name is too long. I'll just call her Maya. Same reason. She's playing a 7-year-old here, aka herself. Sounds good? Okay. Maya says something that contributes to the mystery plot. Boy, too bad there's not some machine on the other side to suck it out, huh, Dad? So Culver and Wingate go to the airport to speak to the person responsible for sucking out all the waste from the plane. The guy they talk to tells them that the person they're looking for is sick and then tips off the rest of the crew. What happens next? Eh, this storyline isn't compelling enough to last more than one episode. Let's just see how Sam's first date goes and get this over with. Sam ends up wearing a... Everyone's problem with this scene is this. Who wears a dress on a date in the 80s? The answer is simple. She explained it earlier. Just because it's my first dance doesn't mean I have to look like it. My problem is this. Why a terno? Ternos are worn on formal occasions. Certainly not on first dates. 
and certainly not by teenagers. One thing's for sure, anime Samantha will never wear a dress like that, nor have that hair. I have questions. A lot of questions. Anyway, Sam's date bails out on her through the phone. Not even brave enough to tell her in person. He's an asshole! Eh, still better than being ghosted. Hey, how are you? I don't expect a reply to that anytime soon. After all, this is just an empty phone case. Upset, Sam goes to her bedroom. Culver follows. <laughs> I like how Maya took a piece of candy and shoved it down her mouth. Nice touch. I'm not gonna spoil what happens next. This is the climax of the episode. It's both a touching and a painful scene, considering how Samantha's story played out in real life. Out of all the scenes in this episode, it's worth watching. I promise. Roll credits with a blooper, the dedication card, and Coca-Cola. New Coke most probably. This is 1985 after all. And that was Lime Street, the mystery of Flight 401. What did I think of it? One word. Frustrating. Frustrating because the show had and still has potential. I haven't seen a show with this premise. And when I do, it's usually an uncle and animated. Well, there's one non-animated medium at the top of my head, which involved the dad. But that was a movie, not a show. Having a detective dad can lead to many adventures and mysteries, either for a single episode or a story arc. And the entire family can join in. I like seeing Robert Wagner as a dad. As Culver, he is firm, but he's not heartless. I like seeing Sam and Maya. Their dynamic as sisters is fun to watch. Some teasing there, but just playful. Trust me, it can be worse. No, I never saw that one. Oof. Maya's character in this Lime Street episode is not unchecked. She's not. I'm younger and cuter, so I can get away with anything. When Margaret Ann tells Elizabeth not to act sexy on a date, Culver tells her off. I can handle this myself. I also like how Margaret Ann contributes to the mystery story with her one line. Boy, too bad there's not some machine on the other side to suck it out, huh dad? This could have been a regular thing on the show. Have her say one-liners while Culver is doing something daddy-related. A line which points the mystery plot to a new lead. Let's talk about the older sister now. Sam believably plays the role of a teenage girl. Because of course, she was one. Unlike her appearance on The Tonight Show and the Disney Channel special that she hosted, Sam doesn't seem uncomfortable here. She appears to be at ease. It was nice to see her growing up here. She certainly wasn't the 11-year-old who went to the Soviet Union. Not anymore. The family plot is good. The problem is everything else. The episode exposed from the start who done it. What keeps the audience from getting vested then? Even Scooby Doo unmasks the villain at the end of each episode. The Mentalist, another detective series that I watch, showed what really happened near the close, not the start, of each episode. No wonder people tuned in to the four grannies instead. I grew impatient watching Wingate try to follow the angle that somehow, D.B. Cooper was involved. Where does it lead to? Nothing. Because the audience already knows what really happened. Besides that, Wingate spends much of the episode getting into the good graces of the FBI. What for? Obviously, the FBI, a government body, won't want to be overshadowed and encroached upon by two mere private investigators. Most of the progress in uncovering the mystery comes from Culver, who, from the very beginning, suspects that the flight crew was responsible. Is Wingate just the second banana? Let the fine British chap have his glory. If there's any consolation, at least he gets the girl this time, and not Culver. I'm glad I've seen this episode. I'm happy it's online. 
I don't think I'll watch it again though. Do you agree with what I've said in this review? What did you think of the mystery of Flight 401? Have you seen other episodes of Lime Street? What did you think of them? Where can I watch all these other episodes? What are your thoughts on them? Did you work on the show? What are your memories on working in Lime Street? Could the show have survived without Samantha? Would Lime Street have succeeded if she lived? Are Saturday nights supposed to be for family-friendly shows? Do you think Lime Street is a family-friendly show? Can a show like it work today? Should it be remade? Please comment below. Please like and share this video. Subscribe and ring the bell to be instantly notified of future episodes of In Hindsight slash Balik Tanaw. Thanks for watching. This is the point of the episode where I sing. Here's Jim Croce's Time in a Bottle, which perfectly fits this scene. If I could save time in a bottle, first thing that I'd like to do is to spend every day till eternity passes away just to spend them with you. But there never seems to be enough time To do the things that you want to do once you find them I've looked around enough to know That you're the one I wanna go through time with